from the moors of Devon to the fens of Lincolnshire. Rural areas across Old England, according to regional folklore, are said to be haunted by a mysterious, preternatural canine, most often described as an immense black dog with glowing red eyes. Variously referred to as the Bargast, Hairy Jack, or the Black Shuck, depending on the county in which it is seen, this furry phantom is almost universally regarded as a sinister entity, considered to be a hellhound or servant of the devil, some sort of malevolent, shape-shifting fairy, or an omen of death. The beast is most often seen prowling medieval ruins, ancient burial grounds, lonely highways, and places of execution. One famous historical sighting of the Stygian Spectre took place on Sunday, August 4, 1577, in the quaint market town of Bungay, Suffolk, near the eastern end of the Anglian Peninsula. According to English clergyman Abraham Fleming, who recorded the incident in his 1577 book, A Strange and Terrible Wonder, the apparition materialized at the height of an unusually violent lightning storm, somewhere between 9 and 10 a.m., when the pious residents of Bungay were gathered at the local St. Mary Church for divine service and common prayer. In the middle of the service, while the church shook from the force of the tempest, a flash of fire erupted in the middle of the nave, out of which sprang a ferocious black dog. Many members of the congregation were convinced that Judgment Day had arrived. This black dog, Fleming wrote, if we convert his prose to modern English, or the devil in such a likeness, running all along down the body of the church with great swiftness and incredible haste, among the people, in a visible form and shape, passed between two persons as they were kneeling upon their knees, and occupied in prayer as it seemed, wrung the necks of both of them at one instant clean backward, insomuch that even at a moment where they kneeled, they strangely died. There was at the same time another wonder wrought, for the same black dog, still continuing and remaining in one and the self-same shape, passing by another man of the congregation in the church, gave him such a gripe on the back that therewithal he was presently drawn together and shrunk up, as it were a piece of leather scorched in a hot fire, or as the mouth of a purse or bag drawn together by a string. The man, albeit he was in so strange a taking, died not, but as it is thought is yet alive. Fleming went on to explain how the black dog after leaving claw marks gouged into the very stone of the church as evidence of its rampage, later made an appearance at Holy Trinity Church in the village of Blytheborough, about 13 miles away. The creature materialized atop the church's rude beam, an ornately carved horizontal timber separating the altar from the nave, which, despite the crown-sanctioned iconoclasm of 1547, still supported a large crucifix. It bounded down into the nave and killed two men and a boy. It also burned the hand of another parishioner, and knocked down many more. This mischief thus wrought, Fleming concluded, he flew with wonderful force to no little fear of the assembly, out of the church in a hideous and hellish likeness. Stories of mysterious black dogs with paranormal qualities are not exclusive to the British Isles, but also appear in Canadian folklore particularly in the traditions of the Anglo-Celtic inhabitants of the Maritime Provinces. Unlike the infernal, red-eyed canines of English folklore, which have a strong association with the diabolical, the black dogs of Atlantic Canadian folklore are usually perceived as manifestations of human ghosts. Folklorist Helen Creighton included several old black dog stories in her 1957 book, Blue Nose Ghosts, all of them set in the province of Nova Scotia. The first story is the account of two boys from the community of Seabright, located on St. Margaret's Bay north of Peggy's Cove, at the western end of the Chibacto Peninsula, opposite Halifax. One still night, at around midnight, the boys were walking down a railroad east of town when they encountered a large black dog they had never seen before, standing in the middle of the tracks. Nearby was a culvert that passed beneath the tracks, where a man had shot himself to death some years before. Idly wondering who the animal belonged to, the boys rushed past it. As they did so, they both felt a sudden, unaccountable rush of wind. Creighton implied that the boys ever after believed a black dog was the spirit of the suicide. Creighton heard her next black dog story from a man named Reuben Smith, who lived in the community of Blanche near the southern tip of Nova Scotia. 
Blanche is connected with the northerly settlement of Port Clyde by a 15-kilometer or 9-mile road. Roughly halfway between the two settlements is a community called Cape Negro, renamed Eel Point in February 2023. And at the edge of this community was a little bridge over which the old road passed. This bridge was said to be guarded by a black ghost dog, which menaced travelers who attempted to cross the bridge at night. Smith's grandfather, Ross, believed he had encountered the ghost dog years earlier, while walking from Blanche to Port Clyde dressed in his best suit, the one he had worn on his wedding day. After passing an old house near the bridge, the black dog appeared, standing defiantly in the middle of the road. When Ross attempted to edge by, the dog attacked him and tore his clothes to ribbons. He saw the same animal a second time while driving his horse and wagon one dark and dismal day past the forested area which Smith referred to as Eli's Woods. It didn't stop him, he said, but it bothered him, and he never knew what to make of it either. Other ghostly black dogs were said to haunt the community of Scottsburn at the northern end of Nova Scotia. Potter's Hill, in the community of Victoria Beach on the Bay of Fundy, not far from the historic settlement of Annapolis Royal, in the Birch Cove district of Bedford, just northwest of Halifax, and in a house in the village of Elgin, New Brunswick, located at a historic crossroads. One of the last and most sensational black dog stories in Blue Nose Ghosts is the tale of John Obe Smith, an elderly man from Glen Haven, just north of Seabright. I seen something over here one night coming home, Smith told Creighton. I seen a big black dog coming towards me, and his eyes as big as two fists. I went to fire at him, and the rock went right through him. I threw another one then, and it disappeared altogether. By this time, I was pretty scared, and I was only young. Anyhow, I took to me heels and ran. There was supposed to be somebody killed by an Indian years before, and this was its ghost. Lots of people saw it about 75 or 80 years ago. Although most black dog stories from Nova Scotia portray their shaggy subjects as the manifestations of human spirits, there are at least two such tales from that province which have the same diabolical overtones as their older English cousins. One of these tales appears in folklorist Mary Fraser's 1932 book, Folklore of Nova Scotia. The old people, Fraser began, believe that the devil often assumed a bodily shape, sometimes that of a man, oftener that of an animal, in order to do his work more effectively. There are many stories to illustrate this belief. Fraser went on to explain how, at Antigonish Harbor, on the northern shores of the Nova Scotian Peninsula, there once lived a man who was overly fond of the bottle. One day, this man traveled on horseback to the southerly town of Antigonish, accompanied by his friend Dan. The treacherous bridle path along which they traveled passed over the North River Hill, amid whose rough, tree-clad slopes, Fraser wrote, ghosts loved to wander when night closed in. Fortunately, the travelers reached their destination before such specters were astir, riding into Antigonish just before evening. There, they parted ways, promising to meet up the following afternoon so that they might accompany each other on the return journey. When Dan and his Bacchanalian companion failed to return to Antigonish Harbor by evening the following day, Dan's mother grew uneasy. Something must have happened to them, Fraser wrote. The horses might be frightened by things on North River Hill. Then there was Paddy's Hollow, where they said more than one strange sight was seen and it was very near the burying ground besides. Fearful that the travelers might have had a run-in with one of the phantoms of the trail, Dan's mother asked her nephew, Alex, to look for them. Alex found the travelers with little difficulty, and ascertained the reason for their delay as soon as he set eyes on them. Before leaving town, Dan's companion had indulged his appetite for rum, and was now in dreadful shape, and could hardly stay on his horse. Incidentally, they had also picked up a third unwanted traveling companion along the way, a large black dog which lurked in the darkness behind them. Although Dan and Alex tried to drive the animal away, it obstinately refused to leave them, trotting at their horse's heels like a hairy black shadow. Loath to bring the drunk man back to the home of his poor widowed mother, the travelers took him to the home of Alex's parents, making sure that the black dog remained outside as they quietly stole in through the back door. 
What was their horror, Fraser wrote, to see that, notwithstanding their precautions, the big black dog had passed through the closed doors. Upstairs he came, making for the room where the man lay. But in a room at the head of the stairs, Alex's two little sisters were sleeping, and the dog could not pass their door. All night the dog went up and down the stairs, and Alex knelt at the bedside of the drunken man, and prayed that he might be spared, for death seemed imminent. His prayer was heard. In the morning the dog disappeared, and the man came to his senses. His friends told him of the terrible night they had spent, and of the great danger he had run. He was so much affected thereby, that he reformed completely, and died a good death some years later. Story told by the niece of Alex. He himself told it to her. Another demonic black dog is said to haunt Nova Scotia's famous Oak Island, the site of Canada's longest-running treasure hunt. Legend says that in 1795, three local boys found a large circular depression in a clearing in the trees on the island's eastern end. Over top of the depression, known thereafter as the Money Pit, stretched the strong arm of an oak tree, from which depended a rotting block and tackle. Having grown up on tales of Captain Kidd's legendary buried treasure, the boys began to dig, touching off a search for a mysterious treasure that has cost millions of dollars, directly claimed six lives, and lasted nearly 230 years. Although Oak Island's many treasure hunters have not yet, as of the penning of this piece, recovered the hoped-for motherlode said to lie beneath the surface, they have uncovered, among other things, a supposed booby trap, quantities of coconut fiber, pieces of parchment, a large flat stone inscribed with strange symbols, and fragments of human bone, carbon dated to the late 17th century, all buried deep beneath the surface. In addition to its enigmatic treasure, Oak Island is said to be a hotspot for unexplained phenomena. Throughout the centuries, treasure hunters have reported an inordinate amount of equipment malfunctions on the island, many of them involving mysterious surges of electromagnetic activity. Ghostly figures, phantom lights, and balls of fire have been seen on the island, and blood-curdling shrieks have been heard emanating from the island's triangular swamp at night. One of the island's eeriest spectral residents is a ghostly black dog with fiery eyes, which writer Darcy O'Connor referenced in his 1978 classic, The Secret Treasure of Oak Island. According to some, O'Connor wrote, this creature with blood-red eyes that glow like hot coals is nothing less than Satan's own watchdog. Others contend that it is the ghost of a ship's mascot, left behind by the original depositors. Hannah Dauphiné, who lived on the island in the early 1930s, claimed to have seen it several times lurking around Smith's Cove. Another woman, a relative of island resident Anthony Graves, was once startled by a dog as big as a colt, which disappeared into a wall of solid stone on the north side of the island. Harris Jowdry, who lived into his 90s at Martin's Point on the mainland, spent the first ten years of his life on Oak Island. Some years ago, he told me that he saw the dog in the summer of 1900, when he was nine years old. As Jowdry recalled it, he and a couple of his friends were walking past the money pit one evening, and there was a dog sitting at the sill of the boiler house. He watched us till we were out of sight. It was a pretty big dog, with some black and white on him, and we knew there was no such dog on the island. He was never seen before, and we never saw it again after that. We were scared, I tell you. Jowdry's description of a large dog with black and white fur, incidentally, evokes a black Belgian shepherd named Carney, which lived on the island in the 1960s. Carney belonged to the Restalls, a family of treasure hunters whose Oak Island tenure ended in disaster, when Father Robert and son Bobby Jr. drowned in a water-filled shaft, apparently having been knocked unconscious by subterranean hydrogen sulfide gas. On the subject of the ghost dog of Oak Island, and Robert and Bobby Restall's somewhat mysterious deaths, it is perhaps worth mentioning the disturbing experience of Jimmy Kaiser, the daring Mi'kmaq laborer who retrieved the Restall's bodies from the shaft. In late 1965, about four months after the tragedy, while dozing in the Restall's old shack on Oak Island, Kaiser's sleep was interrupted by the sensation of suffocation. According to his son, Farron, who told the story to journalist Randall Sullivan, who in turn published Farron's statement in his 2018 book, The Curse of Oak Island. 
Dad said it was about 11 or 12 o'clock. He said I had a little fire going. I put some wood on the fire, and then I lay down on the cot and closed my eyes. And apparently he fell asleep. And he said, I woke up, and I couldn't breathe. And he said there was two of the biggest red eyes you would ever want to see, looking right into his. And the whole body was covered with hair, tight and curly black hair. He said that was all he could see, because the whatever it was, was holding him down by his arms, and had him pinned so tight he couldn't move. But then it smiled at him, and said, don't ever come back. My dad said when it let him go and disappeared, the whole building shook. According to Season 4, Episode 3 of the TV series Drilling Down, a companion to the more famous History Channel series, The Curse of Oak Island, which chronicles the ongoing Oak Island treasure hunt. The following morning, Kaiser found that he was covered in bruises, one pattern resembling four fingers and a thumb. The island of Newfoundland, the harshest and northernmost of Canada's maritime provinces, has a few black dog legends of its own. In his 2017 book, Haunted Ground, Ghost Stories from the Rock, for example, writer Dale Jarvis refers to a black dog which is said to haunt Coley's Point near the ancient town of Bay Roberts on Conception Bay on the northern finger of Newfoundland's Avalon Peninsula. This canine phantom is believed to be connected with a deadly shipwreck that occurred off Coley's Point long ago and is said to appear at the same time of day at which the tragedy took place, but only when the weather evokes the stormy conditions which drove the ship to its untimely end. In his 2010 book, Ghost Stories of Newfoundland and Labrador, Writer Edward Butts included a variation of the Black Dog legend, set in the fishing town of St. Brides, formerly known as Distress, located at the southwestern end of the Avalon Peninsula. In 1804, a strong young man named Thomas, who had a reputation as an excellent hunter, set out from that place to visit his father, who lived in the village of Point Lance, located a few miles to the southeast. As was his custom, he kept his musket beside him in a horse-drawn cart, loaded and primed just in case he encountered game along the way. About halfway to Point Lance, Butts wrote, Thomas spotted a big black stag in front of him. He quickly grabbed his gun and fired. Thomas was a crack shot, but to his astonishment, the bullet had no effect on the stag. He reloaded and fired again. The animal stood unmoved. In frustration, Thomas loaded his gun with a double charge and blasted at the stag once more. He couldn't have missed, but to his amazement, the stag was unharmed. Fearing that there was something uncanny about this invincible black animal, Thomas swung back into his cart and drove to Point Lance as fast as his pony would take him. There, he described his disturbing experience to his father and some of his friends. Instead of sharing his misgivings, the older men simply laughed at him, advising him to spend more time at target practice. Thomas left Point Lance that afternoon and headed for home, his fears perhaps assuaged by his father's unconcern. Several hours later, his pony dashed up to his house, cartless, riderless, and thoroughly spooked. Alarmed, his neighbors formed a search party and set out to look for him. They found Thomas dead on the road between Distress and Lance Point, his face covered with gunpowder which had been dumped out of his own powder horn. But there was no mark of violence on his body. Butts wrote. It was never discovered who or what had killed him. Butts then related how Thomas's wife, brother, and friend met the same mysterious fate shortly thereafter while on their way to a baptism. Their bodies were found in the same place where Thomas had died, Butts wrote. Tracks in the dirt indicated that they had run around in a blind terror, but whatever had killed them did not leave a trace. The mystery has never been solved. The last story we will explore in this piece is not a legend of the Canadian Maritimes, but rather one of the Icelandic Canadian oral narratives recorded by folklorist Magnus Einarsson in his 1991 book of the same name. In the mid-late 1960s, Einarsson traveled throughout the prairies west of Lake Winnipeg, in a region known as New Iceland for its large population of Icelandic Canadians, for the purpose of collecting old folktales. One of the old-timers he visited was a retired farmer and fisherman named Edward Gislason who lived in a farmhouse near the town of Arburg, Manitoba. Gislason told Einarsson that one of his friends, many years before, 
had an unusual experience while working for a farmer in the Geyser settlement, between Arburg and the rural community of Riverton. He said he had stepped outside one evening, Gieslason explained, and he said it had been especially bright and cloudless, and then he sees a very large dog standing there. He said he had probably been 14 feet high, and he described him for me very precisely. It was large and black and curly, a very beautiful dog, so I asked him whether he had mentioned this when he came back inside to the people. No, he said he had known there was no point in mentioning this, that they wouldn't have believed him. But at first, he said he hadn't understood this at all, but then the farmer told him that he had shot at one time an extremely large dog from out of the window, and that it was exactly in the area where he saw this dog. 